Hello guys, it's Alain Andalus, and today we will do a video with Typeflow. We will simulate this construction of a Lego that in fact it's played in reverse, so it's way easier. If you are one of my patrons, you can download the scene. If not, just follow this video. If you want to use a Lego model, you can grab it from GrabCAD. I will have the link below. They had a lot of great models for Lego and other CAD data. The model comes into a step format. It's cool because 3ds Max can import all this type of CAD data without any problem. So simply select the file and you will have this menu to select how dense you want the mesh because it's creating a conversion. The default is quite good. Max can deal quite well with it. You will need to rotate 90 degrees the model in order to have it on the correct uh, axis. The pieces come inside multiple groups, so I will ungroup the objects multiple times until I have the object as an edit mesh. If you want to see the model in a better quality, you can switch the standard view to high quality, so you will see ambient occlusion, shadows, and all these type of things. You can go to the environment map, pressing 8, and let's add an HDRI OSL. This way we can load an HDR map that will allow us to illuminate and as well create reflections into our car model. To edit this HDRI, you can simply drag and drop to material editor, and now we can select different options. I like to turn on the ground projection, uh, just the radius, so the car will sit over the floor. If you still want the illumination from the HDRI, but you don't want to see it on the viewport, turn on the Use Custom Background and switch to any color that you want. To edit the materials, use the pipette, select one of the materials in the car, and you will see that automatically everything is loaded as a physical material, that is great, but it uses the glossiness by default. I am more used to roughness, so you can switch it to roughness, and right now with roughness to zero, it's very reflective. You can tweak it to 0 0.2, uh, but by default, because it's zero glossiness, means that it's not reflective at all. So you can switch these materials as you want. The great thing about physical material is that it looks good on the viewport, but you will be able to render with V-Ray, Arnold, Corona, Final Render without any problem. Now I am rendering with Arnold, and you can see that it matches totally what we see on the viewport. So let's just start preparing this scene for Typeflow. We need a floor to collide, so create a box, whatever you want. Let's go into Typeflow, and we will create a birth object to be able to import our objects inside Typeflow. To work in a comfortable way, we will not import all the objects into Typeflow, just import a one quarter of the car. This way we will be able to work way faster with Typeflow. Add a surface test operator, and we will select one object that I have on the scene that basically has, it's a low res version of my car, and it's a scale down over time. We want that all the objects that are outside this object go to a different event. So make sure to select this volume, and on surface test, we will select by volume outside. Let's create a new event. You can simply shift and drag display event and change the color to make sure that we are able to display the particles that switch to this different group. Let's add some action to this different group. I will add a physics. So in this way, the particle enter on physics mode. By default, it has gravity. And you can see that they collide between them already. We can see, for example, on this wheel, we had some explosion that normally you will not like that. And that's because if you display convex hull, how physics works, is creating this convex hull and everything that is inside, it will try to make it go away. We can try to tweak it with the penetration offset. You can try to increase, decrease that, and it can affect it a little, but because we have two objects, really one inside the other, it's not really easy. We have as well the size multiplier. The size multiplier, what we'll do is the convex hull will be way smaller, as you can see here, and we'll avoid a little the explosions. But in this case, we had one object inside the other. In this specific case, something that will help a lot is the velocity limits. You can reduce the impulse to something like 20, so it will never impulse this with a velocity bigger than 20. Uh, be careful, because in this case it can help, but sometimes reducing this a lot can cause other problems in other areas. On the specific case of these wheels, it's very visible because they are two big objects, one inside the other. So instead of fixing it with the impulse that can help, we can uh, go into edit poly and attach the two objects together. So instead of having two objects, we will have one object and we will not get this breaking or explosion effect. We go back to type flow and you can see that now it's one object and we don't have the problem anymore. The surface test is activating the particles on the first frame and we don't want that. 
This way it's when filters are very handy. Let's add a filter and we will change the property type. We will change it by time frame. Then we will need to change as well the time frame to something like 15 and test true when it's bigger than 15. So in this way, the surface test will only be active when the time frame is bigger than 15 frames. And you can see that now when we recover the particles to the original frame, we have 15 frames of margin. Gravity can be too strong for what we try to achieve. The gravity in tide flow is on the tide flow itself, so you can switch to 0.25 or something like that. And when we try to recover the pieces, we'll be a little slower. Something interesting on the original model is that if you switch to local, you will see that the axis points more or less where if you construct this, how you will put this piece back in place. So the smaller ones, as you can see, the Z points to where you would like that it connects. It's not happening with all the pieces, but this can help with what we want to do next. To make this move along this axis, what we can do is break the connection that we had on this new event, create a new one, shift and drag the display, and change the color as well. It's good to be able to identify in which event you are all the time. And we will create a speed node. This basically adds a speed to our particles. Connect it from the surface, let's send it to this speed event, and you will be able that it creates random velocities per particle, so each particle will go along. Now, change the direction on a speed to particle Z, so you want that the particles move along the Z axis of each particle. Overall looks good, all the small particles are aligned correctly, but some of the bigger particles, the axes are not where we should expect. So what you can do is simply go to these bigger uh, objects, go into Affect Pivot Only, and make sure to be on Local, and change the, the axis. So the Z axis will point to wherever you want that this object move. I didn't do it with all the objects with the car, but I select some of the bigger one more obvious to make sure that the Z axis point upwards or to the place that I want that it comes from. So that's pretty good. I like that the particles looks like coming from different directions and it's kind of like a manual construction. But now I would like to send these to the physics again so they had gravity and interact with the ground. For that, we will add a property test and the property test, we will connect it to the physics. This property test will be based in something, in this case, on the event age. So select event age and we can say that when the particle stays on this event for X number of frames, it goes to the next event. So make sure to switch test true when it's greater than and select a number of frames. We can play with 10, 20 uh, frames, then they will go to the next event that is the physics one. So this starts to look good, but now I would like to do an extra step and it's that the smaller particles or elements, they will appear a little later. So these small elements that you normally add to connect big uh, pieces will appear some frames later. To do that, on the surface test, we will add another filter. This time will be um, a volume test and we will make sure that when the volume is bigger or smaller than a certain value, goes to one event or the other. So now let's play with this volume value until you found that only, you only select the bigger particles. Uh, so it's trying it. We can see that 0.8 is a sweet spot to filter these smaller particles. You, can, you need to switch. And uh, now what we'll do is copy paste the surface test. And on the second surface test, we will select the volume filter and make sure to switch greater by less or equal. So in this second one, we will select only the smaller particles. This way we can send particles to one event or the other, depending on the volume. To create an offset on the bigger pieces, let's create a time test, connect the first surface test to this new event, uh, make sure that it's set to event age, and test through if it's greater. So this way we will filter the bigger particles, we'll go to this event, we'll wait for 20 frames, before it goes to the next event. The smaller pieces will go to the next event directly. So now if you play, you will see that all the smaller pieces go with a delay. That's what we want. They enter a little later and it creates a cool effect, like kind of a cool uh, Lego effect, filtering these two different events. It adds a little of complexity to our simulation. We can see that all these smaller pieces enters on the same frame. We can add another event age connected to this second 
event and basically keep the values lower so it will be a still an offset between the bigger and the smaller but these smaller pieces will get an offset between them as you can see right now so globally the effect is done it's a matter of tweaking for whatever you will like in this case i will add a force on the physics parameter and i will add a tie vortex tie vortex makes the particle rotate make sure that the tie vortex is on the center where you want that the rotation happens and on force pick this tie vortex that you created and you will see that the particles will rotate a lot now this is happening all the time let's filter them so it only happens during a certain frames let's add a property test as a filter and set it as an event age make sure to set be set as less and the value will be 15 20 frames this means that when the particles enter on this new event the tie vortex will only happen during 20 frames then will be off make sure to turn off pull force because you don't want in this case any pull force so right now we only have vortex force and it creates an interesting effect i think to give a little of more random motion i will add a spin on the event 3 basically will make that the particle rotate slightly a little so don't make it too strong and you can have some randomness between them it will help to break a little the, the simulation i will add as well as low operator on the physics uh, part it will slow down the particles in other softwares will be a friction five percent should be enough for final simulations make sure to go to half subsample uh, this will help to don't have vibrating particles when you have physics enabled. Take in account a very important part of this uh, effect is how you activate these particles and it's based on this object. So changing the pivot point will make that this object scales in a different way, also changing the curve and it will be an important part of the appear effect of the object. So when you are done, simply select all the pieces of the car on your birth operator. This will import everything. I am on a laptop, so this can be a little slow when all the particles are inside, but really it's taking like really few time for iFlow to create a simulation. It takes maybe a couple of seconds simply to display the objects on viewport because we are talking about uh, 14 million polys, but yeah, it's great. As you can see, it takes a matter of seconds to display all these objects. And when it's simulated, it's in cache, so going back, it's way faster. So congratulations, simulation part is done. But now we want to render that. I will use Arnold, but you can use V-Ray or whatever. The problem is that to assign materials in Typeflow, we have a problem. Each object has a different material, so we cannot override at the end all the materials by another material because we have 20 different materials. What we will do is to assign one single material to all the objects with multiple sub-materials. You could do this manually, but I am a little lazy, so always do the easiest part possible. We will use a script. In this case, Chang So Eun created this script for me. Thank you a lot, Chang So. I will post the link to download the script below and as well the link of the page of Chang So. Basically what it does is iterates over all the objects. It will detect which materials we have present and it will create a multi-sub ID material with assigning IDs automatically to the particles. So basically what you need to do is press Ctrl E, it will do all this process automatically, and yeah, just wait a couple of minutes. It will create a multi-sub object material on the slot one of your material editor. So make sure to select all the objects and apply this new multi-sub object material. Some smoothing groups are broken, so what you can do in 2021, simply add a weighting normals and it does the job very well. So when you see objects that the normals are a little weird, apply a weighting normals. Because this animation is going really fast, I didn't correct all, them, all of them and it looks still good with a motion blur and everything. So something that happened to a lot of people that they try to render Typeflow and nothing renders. That's because you need a mesh operator on every event that you want to render. By default, what you see is only a display, a viewport display, but it's not generating mesh. When you create a mesh, it physically generates a mesh. Now, as you can see, we have a render only button. Uh, let's deactivate that right now. When you deactivate the render only, it will create the mesh as well on viewport. And now you can select the Typeflow directly as it is another object and select modifiers or whatever. And as well, we can apply materials directly to them. So let's create the material that we created with the script. 
and you will see that it displays now the materials correctly on viewport. Uh, something that you can do now is to mark again at render only, so it will only mesh at render, on, at render time, will make your viewport faster. Now it's important that this mesh you instance or copy to every event. You can do this faster if you deactivate die flow, so it's not rethinking all the time. And right now you are done. I will create a physical material for the floor, assign it. We want this kind of reflective material. So let's add a little of color, kind of dark, really dark. And right now we'll reflect with a perfect reflection. We want it to break it a little. So I will increase it to 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So it has a little of roughness. And that's all what you need to do for, for the floor. Create a camera, whatever you want. You can do Ctrl Z and enable motion blur because we would like to have an effect of motion blur and I will enable as well depth of field. Depth of field is using the target of your camera to focus, so make sure that your target point is wherever you want to focus the image and then you can play with the aperture to define if you want a bigger or less uh, depth of field. You can see on viewport the effect when you are unrealistic and it's uh, pretty cool. We can tweak the ambient occlusion. This is only visible on the viewport, but maybe you want to do viewport previews. Go to per view settings and you will have a radius. By default, it's 30, that it's too big. Uh, let's go for this scene 0 0.3, 5.3. You can play with it, but you will see that 0 0.3 will showcase much more the details because the radius is now smaller. We are having shadows by the HDRI map on the environment, but I would like to create a light to reinforce these shadows, to have a primary source. I will use a photometric light. You can use Arnold light, photometric lights are as well available. If using photometric lights, you will be able to render with Arnold, V-Ray or any other renderer. And make sure to adapt as well on the camera, the exposure to don't burn it. So we are ready to render. I simply press render in Arnold and you have here the result. I didn't tweak all the materials. I sh should adjust the material roughness that and some of them didn't tweak it like the wheels. Before rendering the full animation, make sure to go to a frame where particles are moving and adjust parameters in the sampling properties in Arnold. Normally I increase camera samples to 4, 6. Diffuse and specular are important, increase it if you see noise on these areas. Ray depth is for number of bounces on the GI that normally at one it's good enough. Try a render and check the levels of noise and if it's good, you are ready to go and render your full animation. And that's all. I hope that you like this tutorial with Typeflow and a little of Arnold that I like Arnold more every day. A lot of cool stuff coming. If you are one of my Patreons, thank you so much. Consider being one of my Patreons. You will have this scene to download for free. And if not, uh, please give a comment, give a like, share it with your friends. And yeah, thank you a lot, guys. See you soon. Bye.